Hello, everybody, and welcome to our eighth edition of Spotlight HBG, our weekly live show in which we introduce you at home to the amazing people that work for the city of Harrisburg. Today's guest is Deborah Sibbering. Deborah is the city of Harrisburg's Equal Opportunity Employment and Diversity Officer, as well as our liaison to the Harrisburg Human Relations Commission. Deborah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about uh, the work you do here for the city of Harrisburg, um, but uh, we're also going to look at your life and uh, maybe people watching are interested in a career in uh, human relations. And I think, uh, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation today. I want to begin, however, as we do every week with the latest uh, COVID news from BioBot, which is our, uh, our, our, our wastewater uh, treatment analysis of the prevalence of the virus in the city's wastewater system. If you look at the graph that we have up on the screen, you'll see that um, we're still at a very uh, high concentration level. In fact, uh, we're higher than we were at this point last November. And we really didn't begin to see the spike until December of last year. So we are monitoring the situation very closely and um, it's nerve wracking uh, because if you look at the virus concentration in comparison to the other samples, we are still at a concentration level that is 90% higher than all other concentration levels in the municipalities throughout the country that BioBot tests. And our estimate this week is that we have about 110 new cases of COVID in the Harrisburg and the Harrisburg area on a daily basis. So um, the, best, uh, the best message uh, today, as it has continued to be, is please get vaccinated if you haven't, get your booster shots uh, if they're available to you, and um, continue to take precautions, especially as more and more people are coming indoors after uh, a summer and fall of good weather. Um, uh, make sure you wear a mask if you're in a uh, concentrated space with lots of other people. I tell you, we just had the job fair at the city of Harrisburg this morning. Uh, in fact, it's going on as we speak. Uh, and come down to City Hall if you're watching this live and uh, and take advantage of uh, the many employers that are there. Um, but uh, an example of how events are starting to move indoors and we just have to, we have to uh, take the standard precautions. Um, Deborah, I'm gonna turn to you and we're gonna talk about, uh, about your life and your career. Um, I wanted to begin, as we begin most of these shows, with a, a little bit of a discussion of your childhood. I knew you grew up in New Jersey, and you were the daughter of a police officer and a nurse. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how your parents influenced you growing up. Um, well, my parents were very community-oriented. Um, when my parents had gotten married, obviously before we were all mm -hmm. born, um, my dad joined the National Guard. Um, and then when we settled down in Passaic, New Jersey, um, my dad uh, joined the police force. He was the first African-American police officer in the town of Passaic. Wow. And my mom at one point wanted to be a, uh, she wanted to run a funeral home, but my dad kind of convinced her to do something else. So she went to school for nursing. Wow. Um, and that was when you didn't have to go to a four-year college for nursing. Mm -hmm. um, you just became an intern at a hospital. And, and you grew from there. So she spent her career in nursing and he spent his career in law enforcement. Interesting. So uh, what was it like um, with, uh, with having a father who was in law enforcement? How did that help shape your sort of perspective on law enforcement generally? Well, both my parents really shaped my love of people as a whole. I mean, they really genuinely cared for all people. Um, so we grew up, and, and to this day, my brothers and I, we, we really do care for people, no matter you know who they are um, and where they're from. And I think a lot of that came from my dad's belief of keeping community safe and cohesive because he was very active in the community as a police mm -hmm. officer. Um, he would have these block parties, uh, and everyone knew he was a police officer, and um, it just influenced my thinking as to how you should always be a part of the community in which you reside. Oh, that's great. And, uh, and uh, so growing up, you went to public school in, uh, mm -hmm. in New Jersey and then eventually on to Montclair State. What yes. was it like uh, uh, going there for college? Um, for Montclair State is a beautiful campus. Um, 
I, I I had a hard time adjusting because I am the only girl in my family and I'm mm -hmm. the youngest, mm -hmm. so I was a little spoiled. And then when you go off to college, you're not nobody is pampering you or or, <laughs> or treating you any kind of special way. So in the beginning, I struggled, but um, it was a positive experience. Um, while I was there, I started working in the personnel office. Mm -hmm. That's what human resources used to be to called. And um, I, I really enjoy that. I, I enjoyed working with people, um, and I enjoyed solving problems, and I had a knack for it. Um, and my career progressed from there. Yeah, so uh, is that what you would say uh, human resources is really all about? Is it, is it about solving problems, working with people? If people are watching this um, and they're interested in a career path, um, mm -hmm. is that what attracted you to it? And have, have you found that to be the case as you've moved on in your career? No, that that is definitely what attracted me to it. Mm -hmm. When I was going to college at that time, and you're trying to pick and choose what you want to be at the end of, at yeah. the end of it all, no one was saying, I want to be a human resources or equal opportunity officer. Yeah. That just wasn't in the cards at that time. Um, so my exposure was definitely from working on campus at Montclair State to the human resources field. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay, so um, you you pretty much go into HR immediately um, after college, and uh, I just learned from you that at the time, uh, the school district uh, in 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 uh, in that part of New Jersey was really struggling, mm -hmm. and your first uh, job outside of the college was working in HR for part of a school district that had just been taken over by by the by the state. Um, uh, how did you find that job, and uh, what did you do as, as uh, part of this new HR team? Okay. Well, one of the deans at Montclair State, who I had worked closely with, um, was on the transition committee when the state of New Jersey was taking over Patterson mm -hmm. Public Schools. So that's when the state come in and say, we're going to manage this until there's some stability and the students are um, receiving better education. Um, so I applied for a position in human resources, deputy director of human resources, and in that role I was responsible for all non-certified staff, um, but since it was a very contentious time, mm -hmm. I mean all the students, the staff, the parents, the board members, everyone was upset, um, and the employees obviously was upset about the takeover. Nobody wants Mm -hmm. this, this government to come in and take over your local education system. Well, that essentially, that's what happened. Um, and there were a lot of grievances. So I was asked to concentrate on solving some of those grievances. They were in excess of 200, and there were three collective bargaining agreements. I, I can't imagine a more difficult job uh, uh, to, to go into right fresh out of college. Here you are, a yes. uh, young person interested in, uh, in, in a career path, and you're going in the midst of a contentious takeover yes. with, uh, with hundreds of grievances. Well, let's start by drawing the, the parallel to Harrisburg, because mm -hmm. people watching know that the Harrisburg School District was recently taken over by the um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in this case, and that we're currently in receivership, and that uh, uh, receiver Janet Samuels is working to develop a recovery plan. Um, uh, let me ask you, how long was uh, the Patterson Public School District uh, in, in receivership? Did, uh, did, how long did it, did, were you there for the entire span of the takeover? When I was leaving, it was just now being returned to okay. the, the city. Um, it was in excess of seven years. Yeah, and I think that's pretty common uh, mm -hmm. if people are watching this. Uh, it's not something which can easily uh, be resolved in, in a year or two. Although, I hear you had great success resolving those grievances. So <laughs> tell us about uh, about the grievance process. If people aren't used to the public sector or a grievance or a unionized workforce, um, can, you, can you tell us the basics here so that they understand what it means to resolve a grievance and how grievances are filed? Yeah, benefits, wages, and working conditions are all part of the the uh, collective bargaining agreement. So anytime there's a change to those caveats, um, you have to sit across the table from the union and reach an agreement as to how we're going to proceed. Um, in other words, how management and employees are going to interact during the course of uh, business. Um, so there were, like as I mentioned before, several different collective bargaining agreements and they had a lot of grievances because what staff was saying is now the state is coming over, they're going to make these changes, it's changing our work environment and we have to bargain over this. Well, what made it difficult is that the 
collective bargaining agreement was between the city and the unions. Mm -hmm. It wasn't between the state and, and, and the unions. So the state had quite a bit of leverage, and, and they did come in and, and make quite a few changes. Um, how I fit into the role, even as you mm -hmm. said, it was difficult in the beginning. I just use my instinct and my skills when I talk to union representatives. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, amazingly, I amaz I'm amazed at myself when I think mm -hmm. back out of it, um, to reach resolutions because no one knew it was going to happen, not even me, with the state being in control. Um, and in resolving issues through resolution um, became so effective that that was my caveat. There, a lot of different caveats to human resources. You have recruiting, you have health benefits, you have payroll, you have labor relations. Well, I seem to excel in the labor relations. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually the superintendent of the schools at that time um, asked me if I would apply for a new position that he created, and it was director of labor relations, whereas my entire role was working with the union um, and resolving grievances. That's really amazing. And, and you're quite young at this time, and uh, uh, yeah. you're, you're in this contentious environment. And But after what looks to be just a few years, you're, you're promoted to this new director position. Let me draw another parallel uh, to people watching with the city, because uh, the city also went into receivership. And one of the mm -hmm. challenges in receivership was exactly what you were uh, describing, which is when, especially when you, when you go into receivership because of um, financial issues, financial problems, oftentimes yes. Um, the powers that be look to the unions to make certain concessions uh, with regard to benefits or or wages, and that happened in Harrisburg. And um, we're still recovering from that today. So the receivers team came in, um, uh, immediately reduced benefits, uh, you know, sort of froze wages, did a variety of things that were um, were very much out of keeping with where the city had been up to that point. Um, then receivership ended. Uh, I ended up actually taking off, when I took office in 2014, the city was still in receivership. So mm -hmm. it, it, we transferred the power back my first year in 2014. And since then, uh, we've had to negotiate new collective bargaining agreements um, with, with each of the unions, which I've, I've uh, been instrumental in doing, but basically slowly but surely restoring a lot of um, a lot of the benefits that have been pulled back in receivership. It's it's a complicated process and story, but it's yes. one that it definitely benefits from having good relations and having the type of rapport which clearly uh, you were able to do in the Patterson Public Schools. You've got to have both sides um, trust uh, trust one another and uh, feel respected by the process. Uh, so, um, how did the re the receivership progress in Patterson? So, just as you are promoted to this new position, mm -hmm. hopefully, there's some progress that's being made in terms of other aspects of reforming the school district. And did did, did the job get easier as uh, it went along, or uh, uh, did it remain uh, so challenging? Um, the job became easier, but it remained complicated. Yeah. Uh, it was always a complicated relationship because, in essence. Um, my direct report was with the state, but I also had to satisfy some expectations from the board and satisfy expectations from the reigning superintendent. So it was a complicated work relationship, um, but I did excel in the environment because I focused on what I was there to do, um, and that's to make the work environment more comfortable for the employees, thus the employer. Um, would also feel some sigh of relief mm -hmm. um, in a, such a complicated environment. Yeah, and you were obviously respected by the teachers at the time uh, because it ends that you end up getting recruited by the the, the sort of um, na uh, you know na national uh, uh, teachers union effort uh, and moving moving out west. But uh, you know, I think it's important to say that you know when you start, you're on the side of management. You're mm -hmm. dealing with union, um, but you build a rapport, and union sees that you're a fair broker and a good yes. representative of the issues. Pretty unusual, though, to have them recruit you and have you join <laughs> the other side of the of the bargaining table. So how did that happen? The union president that I work with the most often from the teachers union, um, he would say to me often, you're on the wrong side. You know you're on the wrong side. You know, <laughs> management can't be compassionate. You're compassionate. And, and so he's, I thought in the beginning I thought it was, you know, a joke. You know, uh, he was poking me somehow. Um, but then he said to me one day, he said, you should really look on NEA site and look at what's available. And I was curious. Um, so NEA is the National Education Association. Um, 
And they and he was right. There were a lot of labor positions throughout the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I applied for three different states. Um, Wisconsin was one of them. So I was recruited by the Wisconsin Education Association as director of, uh, director of human resources. But I had a plan. Mm-hmm. My plan, because I had already worked for Patterson Public School about 10 years at that time. So I said I was going to work for the union 10 years, and then I was going to be a mediator, a state mediator, or arbitrator. That was my plan, but yeah. it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you almost get there. You, you, you work, uh, I guess it looks for about five or six years uh, mm-hmm. in, on the teachers. So um, why, well, why didn't it not work out that way? How do you end up changing your career path again? Well, personal reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was in Wisconsin, my dad became very ill. And my mom was overwhelmed, so I made a personal choice to leave the Midwest and come back to my home state of New Jersey um, to care for my dad, and that, that's what I did. Um, and then that's when I started working at Home Depot just because I had to do something other than just care for my dad. Right. And the hours was flexible. I could throw some evenings and, and so forth and some days. So that's how I ended up to come back. Yeah, Amen. no, I find I find that very interesting. So you're you're you know you have all this sort of uh, public sector work, and then um, upon the return to New Jersey, looking for additional careers in the human resources field, something that um, works with your your resume. You go in the private sector and you start working for a major national corporation, Home Depot, mm-hmm. as this uh, sort of re- regional um, human resources employment manager. Just briefly, you know, what was what was it? What was the difference? You know, what was it like working in the private sector versus the public sector? Oh, the difference was huge, and I, I'm not even sure, Mayor Papafuse, so I can explain <laughs> it. But retail environment is so much different than oh, the yeah. public sector. Yeah. Um, instead of, there's a lot of interaction with the employees, but there are multiple shifts, um, and there are multiple part-time and full-time shifts. It's a huge staff of employees, um, and. You also interact with the customers to a certain degree as well. Um, So it was a total learning curve for me. At the end of the day, I don't know if I would have stayed if the recession didn't come and and they uh, had to slim down some of their staff. Um, But it was a huge difference. It was an awakening. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. And uh, uh, so now we're up to 2007. Everything's going crazy with the with the economy. Mm-hmm. Private sector is um, is is reeling, and um, but eventually you go back into the public sector and you start working for for government and uh, you start working uh, as deputy director for human resources in Monroe County, mm-hmm. uh, in Stroudsburg, uh, PA. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what it was like uh, going into um, working uh, in government, because that's probably your, the closest comparative to where we are now in Harrisburg. Yes, yes. Working for Monroe County, it's, it's very similar to working um, for the city of Harrisburg. Um, it was home to me. It, it, it was uh, an environment where I felt comfortable and more confident in, as opposed to retail. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it was a very good working relationship with the Human Resources Department, um, the correctional facility, the nursing home, um, children and youth. Um, and, and my concentration was with the, those areas, those departments, mm-hmm. c- correctional, children and youth in a nursing home. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that role, I was a full service human resources representative. And I reported to um, the commissioners who were elected, mm-hmm. and of course, the director of human resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you liked that job, and that was uh, that was uh, really um, fully satisfying. But um, tell us about how you end up uh, coming to Harrisburg and <laughs> and making one final uh, one final geographic trip yes. down from Monroe County to the I re- capital. I really yeah. did uh, I like working in Monroe County, and I probably would have stayed, but the living wage was not uh, doable for me, for yeah. lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, so I figured I'm going to go to the big city, and I moved to the Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. And it almost swallowed me up. Oh. It was just so it was just so out of my character and, and I found it big and cold and not maybe not so clean. And it, it just wasn't for me. Um, so I started looking for positions in central PA, yeah. um, which I had no experience with except when I worked for the county, we would come here for conferences. Sure. Um, and it always appeared to be a nice, nice city. Um, so I was offered a position with the Liquor Control Board, um, and I was there less than a year, and then COVID hit. Yeah. 
Um, so then once COVID hit and I, and I was no longer in that role, um, I started looking for comparable positions. Yeah. And then I seen the advertisement for the city of Harrisburg as an equal employment opportunity and diversity officer and liaison to the Harrisburg Human Relations Commission. Perfect. And then there you are. And here we are yeah, in, in the yeah. midst of COVID. And again, a reminder, we have a job fair right now. We've got over 20 positions at the city of Harrisburg right now. Um, they range from basic uh, labor to administrative assistant to somebody who trims trees or keeps mm -hmm. financial spreadsheets. We've got amazing career paths at the city of Harrisburg. So please, uh, please check that out and maybe come, come on down. Um, and uh, and you have really only been here through the COVID time, and uh, we're not through it yet, as we heard from those initial uh, statistics. But um, let's talk about your job now with the city. So when people hear equal uh, uh, employment opportunity, what 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 does that what does that mean? Okay. That means that the city of Harrisburg has committed, obviously, as the position wouldn't exist. The city of Harrisburg has committed to ensuring that the city not only hires a variety of individuals, not just um, based on race, but uh, different backgrounds, ethnic, religious, um, disabled. Um, so we're committed to ensuring that we have a staff that represents the city in which we're in. And not only that, um, the, the office is a caveat for the community to come and express concerns um, if they have experienced any, um, any, any activity which they view to be inappropriate based on any of the protected classes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the position is there for, and that's who we serve which is why people need to know who you are, yes. and they need to know about the Harrisburg Human Relations Commission. Yes. So um, what is that? Can you explain that in a nutshell to people watching? The Harrisburg Human Relations Commission is a, uh, a commission of volunteers um, from the city of Harrisburg who live within the city of Harrisburg, and they are charged with um, doing for the city what we do for our employees, meaning they want to ensure that everyone that is in the city and benefiting from the city's um, resources are treated equally um, without any type of discrimination. So what the commission does is that, first of all, we put ourselves out and available to the community. Um, if someone has a concern or a complaint, they will contact me as the liaison, um, and they will file a complaint form, and then I would indulge in a full investigation. And then at the end of the investigation, I make a recommendation to the commission, and then the commission will decide what action, if any, is needed at that point. Yeah, now that's, that's fascinating, um, and I wonder, um, so let's talk, without getting into specifics, obviously, of any type of case, what, what is it like conducting an investigation? What does that mean exactly? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess there are different types of investigation, but we could start with, you know, um, in, in your position at the city. If you're investigating um, uh, an allegation or something that comes up over the course of one's job at the city, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one thing. Or if you're working uh, for the Human uh, Relations Commission, that's another. Um, but uh, tell us about uh, the process. Okay. Depending on the, the, the issue, the process may vary a little, but basically they're all, the process is the same for all. There is a complaint, you take the complaint, and you actually review it, and you pick out details that the claimant, the person who files the complaint, the com complainant has said, and then you take those details and you build off of it. For instance, what day, what time, were any witnesses, do you have any paperwork, do you have anything else that you can give me to help assist me in what direction to go? Then a notice is given to the person and or entity who has been accused of the act. And that notice basically says that there has been a claim against you based on, and it could be a, a violation of sexual orientation, it could be age, it could be disability, um, it could be race, um, and you have 30 days to respond. Um, and then in most cases they do respond. Um, they submit a written document telling their side of the story. And then once I have both sides of the story, that really dictates to what happens next. There could be a mediation between the parties, or it can be obvious that there was no violation, or it can be obvious that it was a violation. Whatever my finding is, I take that to the commission and review it with the commission. And then based on the ordinance that we have, we make a decision as to how to move forward from there. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And that, that, uh, that, that type of recommendation then will influence sort of how we move forward, but also may lead to um, new policy or um, uh, better implementation of existing policies, you name it. Um, so how does that, um, what, what in your work history up to this point it prepared you for the investigative side of things? Oh, labor relations, without a doubt. Um, when you start trying to resolve grievances, there is a certain amount of investigation that goes on automatically. Um, it's not just someone files a grievance and you just take off with it. And um, you have to get down to the what caused this grievance, what's the meat and potatoes behind the claim. Um, so working with those unions trying to resolve those grievances is very investigative in and of itself. Um, but also the other part of labor relations is years ago we didn't have EEO offices mm -hmm. uh, or diversity mm -hmm. offices that fell within the caveat of uh, labor relations. Mm -hmm. So when there was time for an internal investigation in the beginning it was only sexual discrimination that you know you mm -hmm. would hear about the most. Um, you have to go and talk to people and document what you're learning and then submit it to whoever the appropriate manager is to make a decision. So it was automatic once I became um, focused on labor relations. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, what, a, what a career path and what a journey. If people are watching this and they're, uh, they're learning and they're, they're thinking uh, more about a career in human relations, what, what would be your advice to a, a young person um, uh, who might be interested in entering this field? Well, you have to stay educated, meaning I'm, I'm a member of the um, Society of Human Resource Management. Mm -hmm. I take advantage of all trainings when it comes to employment laws. You must know employment laws, um, the trends, um, best practices, and you get that from being connected with the right professionals. So I do, to this day, absorb all the information that I can. Um, I participate in labor law conferences. Um, I'm also a member of the local, the, Har the uh, Central Pennsylvania Society of Human Resources. I'm connected with them. So it is one of those careers that you have to stay current. So I would, my advice to anyone who is interested in human resources, you cannot be, you can't be stagnant. You have sure. to always stay current, and then that's how you grow as a professional as well. And as you grow, you advance. Yeah, and I think about all the growth and all the changes that have occurred over the course of uh, of your career. It sounds like mm -hmm. a, a very uh, a very interesting uh, path. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so I wanted to get to a few details about you as a person and um, some of the things I've been I've been told. I I'd love I I know that you have a love of antiques and yeah. uh, older older things in American history generally. Talk, talk yes. to me about that. You know, that's interesting because one of the things my mother used to enjoy um, was garage sales. Oh, yeah. So, you know, as, a little, as far back as I can remember, she would then, because there was no internet, she would get the newspaper and she would circle all these garage sales. And then she put me in a car and we started going to these garage sales. And I quickly learned that I loved old furniture, I love the detail, um, I love the old books. I, I, I just, the things people were selling as junk, I really gravitated to, and I just found it fascinating. Although I wasn't that much of a history person in, in school, mm -hmm. but just from the touching and the seeing and hands on, I began to love anything historic. Um, and as far as uh, history, uh, I do I do love history. And that started with visits to New York City. Okay. Um, I, I did a, developed this fascination in what how New York City began, yeah. you know, like <laughs> when the Dutch came over. Yeah. And, then, and then then I moved, you know, to other areas of American history that I found fascinating as well. So I read about it a lot, um, and, and I have a strong interest in it, and you could just never learn enough from me. So oh, that's, that's great. Well, that's something we share, uh, share in common. What's, what's your greatest or most interesting garage sale find that you've, uh, that you've had? And that's a good one. Yeah. I, I found this little, and this, I was very young. This, this I think, okay. what really drew me in. I found this little wooden box, and I, I didn't even bother to open it. My mother would give me money to shop with, and yeah. she'd be looking at something, and I just went and paid the woman five cents or whatever. And then in the car, I opened the box, and it was this delicate, very delicate um, handkerchief. 
And when I opened the handkerchief up, it was this beautiful lace handkerchief, and it had somebody's initials on it, and it had the year, like, 1907 mm. or something like that. And I just, I just said, oh, wow, this is incredible, 1907. And then I started reading about what happened in 1907. And, and it, yeah. you know, it's just so um, those type of finds, you know, just really excited me. It seemed really small, but I, to this day, I wonder who, whose handkerchief was that. Yeah. You know, did they get where they from New Jersey or did somebody send it to them from the South? I, you know, I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> it's 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 about the, the discovery that, you know, when you when you find an item, when you begin researching it, when you begin learning about the people that may have owned it or, or yes. read it if it's in the case of a book or um, you know, it or, or possess this item. That's that part of that just makes the history come alive. It does. All right, now I have a um, uh, I had a recent conversation with somebody from New Jersey about pizza that did not end well <laughs> because they they tried to convince me that New Jersey pizza, New York style pizza, was the best pizza in the country. And I I am a firm believer in New Haven style pizza. I don't know if you've you've fully uh, experienced that, um, but but what what is your favorite pizza? Because I know that's one of your favorite foods. My favorite pizza is New Jersey pizza. Mm. All right, so so give me tell me where we have to go in New Jersey to uh, to, to get the best pizza. Tony's on Broadway in Pasig, New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> and is it it's thin crust? Then what what's what what is what makes New Jersey pizza to you? And I, I, look, mm -hmm. I, I no offense to I, I'm I'm good friends with the people that need pizza here in Harrisburg, and <laughs> but but Central Pennsylvania pizza um, is is not New Jersey pizza. That's that's no. for sure. So what what makes New Jersey pizza? You know that's interesting. The crust is always perfect. I, I'll start with that. The yeah. crust is always perfect. Yeah. Um, it's not it's never gooey or it's never too thin where your pizza flops. It's just cooked at the right, <laughs> to the right perfection that it needs to be to pick the pizza up and get you know a nice folded bite. Yeah. Um, and I, I hate to say this, but it's true, but it's greasy. Yeah. You know, it's like a greasy hamburger. Well, the that's best hamburgers are greasy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice and greasy, but not too greasy, but it's falling all over your pants. It just seems like in your New Jersey, those pizzerias have perfected in the sauce. Yeah, um, there are a lot of farms in New Jersey. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. But for the most part, they get their tomatoes from New Jersey farms. So yeah. the sauce is outstanding yeah. as well. Well, I always say that the the way you can tell the best pizza is if you can eat the pizza without the cheese. Cheese is wonderful. I want yeah. cheese on my pizza. <laughs> but if you can eat the pizza without the cheese and just yeah. enjoy that sauce, that is that's the key to a yes. great pizza. Um, well, uh, Deborah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us today thank on Spotlight you. HBG. It was fascinating. I wish we could talk all day. Um, and uh, welcome, welcome to Harrisburg. Welcome to the city. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, thanks for watching at home. I hope you learned uh, a lot about another fascinating employee of the city. Um, we appreciate you watching here uh, live on Facebook and elsewhere. And until next time, I'm Mayor Eric Poppenfuss saying stay safe, be well, and we'll see you again on Spotlight HBG.